Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Junior Owns the Spark. Thank you for joining us. Today I will be speaking with historian, author, lecturer, and social commentator, and executive editor of Freedom to Choose Media, Johan Norberg. Welcome, Johan. First of all, delight to have you here, Johan. Thank you very much for appearing. I'd like to know more about Freedom to Choose Media, of which you are the executive editor, so you must know a lot. Hmm. Well, I can try. Uh, if you, by any chance, recognize the name Free to Choose, it's probably because of the documentary series and book by Milton and Rose Friedman in the early 1980s. And the reason why it's called Free to Choose Network is it's the network that brought you Milton Friedman uh, to the world. Uh, originally, and it's a production company and an educational institution. Uh, it's based in Erie, Pennsylvania, but um, most of us who participate come from all around the world. I, I live in Sweden um, most of the time. And we do documentaries, we do video series, video blogs, uh, trying to explain the world, trying to talk about economics, history, technology, talking about free market principles, but packaging it in a bit of a different way than when we write our books and our papers, trying to talk about it through stories, individual cases, the people who are affected by the political decisions that we make. And oftentimes uh, we do it uh, on any kind of streaming source. You can find us uh, on YouTube and all over, but also our documentaries are usually aired on American public television. So that gives us a good audience as well. Uh, before I move on to give us examples of the programs, I would like to ask you to say a word about economist Milton, Fried Milton Rose Friedman, really his philosophy. Yes, and that's really a, a power couple that has been a great source of inspiration to me. Um, one of the um, greatest economists and definitely economist couples of the uh, 20th century. When Milton Friedman died, uh, the Economist magazine ran a headline uh, called How Milton Freed Man, because that's how they uh, looked upon his contribution to society. A Nobel laureate, um, famous for his uh, scholarly work, but also a popularizer of free market ideas in many places, from newspaper columns to the documentary TV series uh, Free to Choose. And it was, he was incredibly influential, he and his wife, they worked as a team, by introducing many of the ideas that we now take for granted, or at least they're in the debate, talking about things like free trade, free enterprise, uh, school voucher systems to introduce competition and freedom to choose in, in education, uh, talking about ways of trying to reform government to work for people rather than, than against them. And they also had an incredible influence uh, behind the communist iron curtain because people there, dissidents and people who doubted the communist system, they read bootleg copies, some is that copies of their books in by candlelight, basically in secret, trying to find out another way of, of doing things rather than command and control, giving people uh, the freedom to, to use their own ideas and, and skills and, uh, and unleash competition. And those people were some of the great reformers in the Eastern Bloc when communism come, came tumbling down. What uh... Uh, program, what programs, what documentaries have you made? What subjects did you think would be interesting? Well, I was actually just reminded uh, by my 
boss, uh, Rob Chatfield at uh, Free to Choose, that I've made 12 documentaries by now on different subjects. And it's all about um, trying to repackage ideas that come from universities, come from scholars, coming from the research that we've done, but through stories. And it's often current events. It could be about what is going on with economic reform in uh, India, what is going on in the energy market. But it could also be historical topics about uh, the Industrial Revolution and how Adam Smith, the, the first great economist, how his ideas helped to unleash the Industrial Revolution and an incredible increase in uh, human living standards around the world over the last 200 years. And, um, and one of my favorites is a documentary that I recently made on Sweden, my own country. Sweden lessons for America with a question mark. Because Sweden is often used and abused, I think, in the American debate. People think that, yeah, look at socialist Sweden. They seem to be doing quite all right. Shouldn't we imitate their policies? Well, that's because people are often stuck in the 1970s uh, and they haven't updated their perception uh, yet. In the 1970s and 80s, that's the time when Sweden was really experimenting with socialist ideas. And that's actually the period when Sweden lagged behind other industrialized countries. The one period in modern Swedish history when Sweden began to decline and lose out and lose the entrepreneurs who, who left Sweden. People like Ingmar Kamprad who founded IKEA and, and the Tetra Paks of, of Sweden, they all left. So, so there are lessons from Sweden for America. And that is be very careful about what you imitate. You should imitate the things that made us strong, not the ones that almost destroyed our economy. I thought Sweden, Sweden's leadership was really quite brave that when they went in the social, socialistic track, so to speak, they stopped and identified where they were and were courageous enough to say, this is really working out the way we thought, and we have to go to a high tax system or whatever they did to enable the services, but realize that people realize they'd have to pay for them. I, I, I if that's true, I mean, a friend of mine who lives in Sweden proclaims it's a capitalist country. That's what people don't understand. You know, high taxes, high services. So that is good to point out to people. I think there's a, what do I want to say? There's a utopian dream. You can have sort of sugar plums and cotton candy and there's no cost for anything. If you want it, you get it. it. And I always say that you should factor into any program at a, at a governmental level of reviews. So what were the <laughs> consequences of this? And should we continue? Often it's done that way, but they just say, we need more money. It didn't really work out. We need more money. And I think that's problematic. And if you're looking really for more, um, solutions, and I'm thrilled you're doing it um, in this manner because it allows people to think about it rather than just feel about it, and um, uh, to your credit. But you've also um, been associated uh, with the Cato Institute and still are, and what is your role there? I'm a uh... I'm affiliated with Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., a senior fellow there. Uh, but it's something then I do from a distance. I don't have an office there. I, I do go there once in a while when, when America lets me in. It's actually only since Monday that uh, America has let fully vaccinated European Center again. And uh, I was first in line, basically. Uh, so it means that I'm part of that network and I'm constantly trying to contribute with ideas and uh, to write papers and uh, give lectures when there's something that uh, seems relevant to an American audience. And it really does help me as well to get a, uh, an audience and a hearing in the United States because Cato has a great network of, uh, of people, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, connections in the media and in politics. The Mount Pelerin Society, of which you're a member, is it a society or a group? Uh, I read the extensive history about, <laughs> about it. When did you join? I joined, it's now, I think, 10 years ago. Uh, 
and it is an impressive institution with a great history. It was founded by people like Milton Friedman and economists like uh, Friedrich Hayek, who at the end of the Second World War was discussing how can we resurrect uh, classical liberal ideas about free markets, open societies, uh, democracy after communism and fascism. And uh, they then met with the remnant of, of people who had their kind of liberal and libertarian ideas in the Swiss Alps at Mont Pelerin and began to compare notes and share ideas on, on how to do things. And uh, it, it's really, I think, the organization that has launched uh, the most Nobel laureates in, in economics over the years. So that's also a great network to, to be a part of. In the write-up I read, uh, there was a, um, not a dispute, but uh, should they keep it small and therefore you could interact easily or should they allow it to be bigger? And they did allow it to be bigger. But then what happened 10 years ago? Are you part of a big group now or a smaller group now? Well, that's always the question, isn't it, for any kind of organization and any kind of uh, social relationship, basically. Uh, you can keep it small and then it's uh, you can be more consistent and close and everybody knows everybody and that's great in itself, but it might stop some of the outreach uh, and, then, and it might help to build a bigger network as well. And that conflict has always been there, I think, in, in Montpellera and it has slowly uh, grown, I would say. And what some of the original scholars think is that moving into people who are not uh, scholars and authors, but pe people who are uh, journalists, who are polemicists in the debate, that's sort of diluting the original purpose uh, of, of the whole thing. So I think it's going back and forth a little bit. So, and, and in a way, I think that tension is necessary because then we, we have uh, both options, both arguments on the table, and we can uh, discuss and constantly adjust as we go forward. What is an important, um, not to be, but in what way is it important for economists to think in a particular manner? I don't mean philosophy necessarily. I mean in the ability to factor in unintended consequences or um, different value systems. I mean, Americans have sort of one value system, maybe Sweden has another value system, somebody else has another. And so can you filter, can anyone filter, including themselves, um, the influence of values on their thinking? That's a great question. Um, it's, I don't think any one of us can really escape ourselves and what we bring to the table whenever we look at the world and trying to come up with the best solutions. But I think it's incredibly important for economists. I think it's incredibly important to historians, anyone trying to understand human action in various ways, to understand where they're coming from and to look at their own values. Because if you don't verbalize them, at least if you don't at least verbalize them to yourself, it means that you're not free from values. There's nothing like being completely free from a particular uh, perspective on the world. But if you haven't verbalized it, it's just there. And it could be a riddle of inconsistencies of things that you've learned from your parents, your education, your social network, and then it'll steer your decisions anyway. So the more you know about yourself and where you're coming from, that helps you to adjust for that and take other things into consideration as well. Uh, I think that one of the major problems with many economists is that they tend to think of the economy as, as a machine and that they are engineers uh, or, uh, and just trying to push the right buttons and get the right results and forget that they are dealing with humans and human actions. And uh, often most of the knowledge, most of the uh, ideas, most of the interesting thing that goes on is local knowledge. It is in each and every one of us, and you can't centralize that. No government committee can do that, and no single economist can do that. And that's, to me, that's a reason to always be in, uh, have a 
there's a slight tendency to go towards liberty and freedom. It's not because I, I know that that's the right button to push on to get the right results, but that's the way to unleash these ideas, this knowledge, the imagination, the ingenuity of, of millions of people and come up with surprising new solutions to our problems. Sometimes you can't quantify uh, uh, pluses. I'm thinking of when I moved to, to Midland from York, uh, following my marriage to someone who was born and raised here. Uh, kids went to school, K, I guess six or whatever, but they came home for lunch. And the mothers liked it because any disputes or upsets they could deal with at lunch. Then the government decided that certain kids couldn't afford it uh, to, to go home or, or have lunch or something. So instead of singling them out with a certain program, they had everybody stay at school and have lunch there. So the mother said they didn't like that. They said, I've lost the opportunity to find out more about what's going on that's upsetting my child or whatever in real time and try and give a more wholesome uh, reaction or way of thinking about it. So. I've been stewing on that because it's a very long time ago that they did that. And I thought, how would you as an economist ever quantify that? I don't know that you'd ever even think about it. Now, that would be interesting to, to even attempt such a thing. Uh, and that's the problem. Some of the things that we hold most dear are impossible to quantify and put into a simple regression or model. Uh, but I think it teaches us something important. And this is an interesting example of that. And that's the unintended consequences of anything that we do. If we think that we need a solution to problems, because there are many problems out there, obviously, but whenever we put one solution into place, it also means that we replace all the other solutions that were already there, or the culture that could have come up with other kinds of solutions to the problems that some of these kids uh, didn't have access to, uh, to school lunches uh, to, or to lunches. Uh, and, and this is something that we need to understand for any kind of policy area. Whenever we say that, look, A, we've got a problem, so B, here's one size fits all solution to this problem for everybody. It means that you can see that you've done something. You feel this glow of, of uh, satisfaction that you've done something great. But what you don't see is what would have happened otherwise. Well, how would people have used their time? How would they have used the resources that are now going, have been diverted to a particular place? And, and that is an uphill battle. You can't quantify something that's not there, but would have been there had people been given more options and more freedom to choose. I'm, I'm asking a lot of these questions because I think it's interesting in America right now that there's this bubbling up amongst the young and the media and college and you name it, you know, how wonderful socialism is and this and that. And I'm saying, where was I? How did I miss that? And why do they think that way? Does it stand the test of time anywhere? And um, it's the same answer. Well, they didn't do it right. <laughs> So, yeah. I don't, I, I, if you, now I've into the psychology of people. Maybe some people need direction or counter to that. Some need to be bosses and they like to boss people around. And that may or may not be useful, but I think for economists, they should sort of hold up a mirror and say, what is the dark side of this in each of us? Or what is the plus side? Because we talk about the pluses, but we don't talk uh, about, you know, what it deflates or what it doesn't value. So uh, you spend time in America now quite a bit when you come and you go, at least you're here now. And what do you see or can you comment on where we are and uh, philosophically? Yes, you are in a bit of a bad place, I think, right now. And, and this is something that recurs throughout history. It, it goes in cycles. Whenever 
people forget the mistakes that were done. They are eager and willing to get back and, and try the same thing again. I'm never really surprised that people like socialism because it sounds wonderful. It sounds like you'll get stuff for free and you'll, you don't have to be responsible for all of your actions because someone is there to pick up the bill. And there's this dream that somewhere there's a big pile of money and let's then just redistribute this in an equal and in a just way around the world. It's not strange that new generations think that sounds tempting. I want to try that. And that's why we need to look at what happens when you attempt to do that and, and to keep repeating the lessons from that story, because that lesson is that sooner or later you run out of other people's money. And as uh, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher put it, what it is about is that people take wealth for granted. They take all these, the living standards that we've got for granted. They don't think about where it came from unless you live in a society where you have only recently unleashed economic growth and, uh, and capitalist production. But in our societies, where we've had that for a long time, people grow up in societies that are already rich, and you think that's just there. They don't think about all the incredibly hard work, all the innovation that it takes to keep this going every day. And whenever we stop, we fall back. And in the places that tried socialism in various forms, it's, it's always the same story. They promise you everything for free, but they end up with bread lines and uh, they end up with people escaping uh, the country as soon as they can and Venezuela is the, the latest example of that. In, in Sweden we, we stopped before it got that far because fairly soon even the left in Sweden realized that what is happening when you start to punish wealth creation, when you don't, it's difficult enough to to come up with successful business models, to attract investors and customers and constantly work around everything from technological, logistical problems to uh, changes in customer preference. But if someone also takes all the results and regulate you out of, of, of business, then it's hopeless. And in Sweden, when we tried this in the 1970s and 80s, what happened was that, first of all, it was our Atlas Shrugged moment. So entrepreneurs and businesses, they left Sweden. But also the next generation, they grew up facing different incentives. They didn't want to engage in this risky behavior if there wasn't a reward for it. And what the Social Democrats in Sweden realized what was that's just a pipe dream. We can't give people all of these things based on the idea that a few rich are going to pay for it. They are too few and the economy is too dependent on them. So they really did an about turn in the 1990s and began to instead liberalizing the Swedish economy, lowering taxes and deregulating many of the most important product markets. And then we got back to, to the future and started to produce and create wealth again. Tell, uh, tell us uh, about how you came to be who you are. Tell us about your family and the family's values. Well, um, you know, I uh, lived in a quite uh, typical uh, middle class neighborhood in the suburbs of Stockholm, Sweden, growing up in the 1980s during the period of a very rapidly expanding uh, uh, big government uh, system. Uh, I had a mother who's a teacher and a father who's a historian. So that taught me uh, the value of uh, learning about the world and, and learning about history. And I think that's what put me, set me on this path because I started out not as a free marketeer or anything like that. I used to believe in the good old days before we had industry and polluting factories and uh, and the, the stressful work environments. I wanted to go back to the past when we lived in supposedly in harmony with one another and, and with nature. But I think it was studying history that uh, got me out of that because I, when I studied specifically my ancestors' history in Northern Europe in the uh, mid to late uh, 19th century, I realized that they didn't live ecologically. They died ecologically. Life was hard on the farm. 
if there was bad weather, there was a crop failure and people starved because they didn't have access to uh, trade, to uh, large scale manufacturing, to, to uh, modern infrastructure, to electricity, uh, to big business. And that taught me never again to take this wealth for granted because it's not there originally. My ancestors had to mix bark from the trees into the bread to make it go last longer. It was only when Sweden began to unleash the skills, the, the talent, the, the innovation of Swedes that we began to make progress. We got economic growth. And since then, I've never looked back, but only thought about how can we expand this to more places and, and make sure that people don't take this for granted. Uh, because of time, I'm going to have to end this most fascinating conversation, but I certainly appreciate your, your being in Midland today and um, participating in this. So a lot of good luck to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was a very fascinating conversation and I love being here. To contact Junia, send her an email at juniadonesthespark at gmail.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadonethespark.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on Junia Dones the Spark. Local productions seen on Delta College Public Media are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.